Generally, I didn't think it was that necessary for me to go super hard out designing these interiors. The best plan was to reuse elements from previous rooms and assemble new rooms out of them. But I also wanted to have at least one unique element so they're not just copy paste jobs of the same generic room. And to also imply the background contexts for each of these rooms. The main point is to have the same attention to detail to flesh out this little world and to add to its believability. These new interiors don't really have any narrative function but they maybe act as liminal spaces between you and the dead people who used to inhabit them. You get a glimpse at how things used to be. Since in terms of the story, most of the people in this village have already died, it nicely adds to that sense of emptiness, almost like voids in people's hearts, abandoned spaces that are left behind. One of the new interiors is this house that has also a downstairs to it. My thoughts when making this place is that this tiny little house is supposed to house a family of three, like how is this possible? Well the obvious answer is that who cares about logic, right? Like in older RPGs, you see a house, you enter it, and it's like five times bigger than it is from the outside. I was originally going to do that, and yeah, to an extent, I've stretched and warped space outside the realms of logic. But I was like, why not take this opportunity to try and add some personality? So in this family house of three, I'll have the parents' room here, a shared communal lounge space, and then an underground room for the kid, which has a balustrade overlooking it. Something kind of comfy. Also, during the night time, I wanted to convey moonlight pouring through the window in these interiors. I love this concept art from Dark Souls 1 of the dark son Gwendolyn sitting next to his father's tomb. Side note, but the actual in-game location of this, uh, because they scaled certain elements, I feel like it doesn't do nearly a good enough job at capturing the pure, sublime majesty of the concept art. I have it hung up in my room actually. But yeah, I wanted the shadows to cast onto the player sprite, which took quite a bit of time at adjusting. For example, I have the shadow layer casting on top of the player, but then there's the shadow of the chair, and this didn't make sense when the shadow was cast onto the player, like this. So I had the shadow baked into the map, so it doesn't cast onto the player and it's like underneath them. There was a similar dilemma when working out the overlay layers, like you really have to take into account the player sprite's height and if they're going to unintentionally conflict with the overlapping drawings. For example, for this chair, I had the slight overlay layer so the player's feet can be hidden by the top lip of that chair. It's like a really tiny detail. But when you're walking in front of the chair, this layer is then drawn on top of the player's head or chest. The easiest solution for me was to just remove this part of the overlay entirely. I think there might be a way for the overlay layer to be drawn behind the player if the player's Y coordinate is lower than the overlay itself. But I don't know how to do that, so the easiest way for me to do this was to remove it entirely. There's a lot of ironing out these little visual hiccups. Then there's simulating dust in the moonlight. I had this idea in my head, but I couldn't figure out a way to do it exactly the way I wanted where the dust was only illuminated by the moonlight coming through the window and nowhere else in the room. But I could only have the dust shown floating through the whole room, not just the specific area. I think it's possible if the dust layer is underneath the player and the room and it's it's too hard for me to wrap my head around so I, I can't be bothered, especially for such a small thing. Maybe it's possible but for now I'm just gonna leave it like this. Then there's rendering weather outside of the room, or just seeing anything outside the room in general. This is possible through Galve's layer graphics plugin and its animation capabilities. Another house is this house where the roof is caved in. I drew the vines coming in through the roof and kind of creeping down the walls. However, since there's a hole in the roof, at first I wanted to try have the rain just pouring down in this one localized area of the room, but I couldn't figure this out. I think the best idea is just for me to patch this roof out from the outside and not have this visual inconsistency. Like, does it matter? I don't think it really matters. I doubt people will even notice it unless I point it out to them. But I notice, so I want to iron out these little inconsistencies. I'll use one room as an example to show things under the hood in a technical aspect. This will be a sort of a preview for the updated parallax tutorial that I'm still working on. So here's the example room. And this is the map properties. I used the notes in the map properties to lay out how the parallax is rendered. This is the text in its entirety. I'll break it down bit by bit. The first one. So within these brackets, I think they're called like greater or lesser symbols. I have CM and then the file name. So in this case, it's top right house collision. I didn't need to put in like .png, like the actual file extension. This I have at the very top of the map notes, and it's another plugin by Qtius. 
This relates to the plugin specifically QM plus collision map, which sets the map collisions. I'm just going to read out the plugin description. It says, to add a collision map to a map, open the map properties and add a note tag with the following, and then it shows the format. Where the file name is the name of the image you want to use that's located in the folder you set in the plugin parameters, so which is here. I store my collision PNGs in the parallax folder, which is what it is by default. I'll bring up the collision map for this particular room. I'll mark out in black the impassable areas and transparent for the walkable areas. You can change the folder being referenced in the plugin settings, but I just keep it at the default parallax folder. The next one, I have this in the brackets again, no tile map. This is another one of QShis's plugins, Q plus specifically. I'm just going to read out the plugin description again. No tile map. You can disable the tile map by adding this node to a map. This will replace the tile map with a simple lightweight sprite container. Using this may increase performance. So if you have a map that doesn't use any tiles and is all parallax, then you should consider using this. Without this, there's this brief flash before the map gets loaded, which are the tile sets, I think. So by stopping the tile set being rendered, it removes this annoying flash and makes the maps load just a bit faster and more optimized. Then there are the actual image layers. This is from Galve's layer graphics plugin. You can do this through plugin commands, but I choose to do it through the map notes. This is the description. Before you start, you'll need to create a layers folder in your project. So slash img slash layers. This is where all your image layers will be taken from. The format is this. This is a brief explanation. I'll go through it one by one. So for example, I'll use this room to talk about how to set up these layers. First, I'll use the main ground layer to talk about each of these parameters. First, type in layer in all caps. Second is the map ID. I didn't use this specifically, so I leave it out. This is more useful when doing plugin commands instead of map notes to render the map. Third number, I type in the number one to indicate that's the first layer. This is the main interior of the room. Note that this doesn't actually indicate the order in which the layers are drawn. That's actually indicated by this number, which indicates the image's z-axis. I'll explain this in a bit. The next number, this is the file name. The fifth number in this is horizontal movement. This controls how fast or in what direction the image will move horizontally. Since this is the ground layer and it's not moving, I set it to zero. The next number indicates its vertical movement. Same here, stationary, so it's zero. The next number is the opacity. So this indicates the transparency of the image. So the number zero means it's fully transparent or invisible. And the number 255 indicates whether it's fully opaque or has no transparency whatsoever. The lower the number, the more transparent it is. The next number is the z-axis or the z-position. This part's very important. This dictates the order in which the layers are drawn. Zero is for the default ground layer. If you want images or layers behind the main room, like showing what's outside the room or having rain shown outside the window, then that number would be like negative one. If I want the layers drawn above the player sprite, then this needs to be five or greater. So shadows, weather effects, overlay layers, all of that would be above five. Next number is x-shift. This means horizontal movement shift that differs from the player movement. This is for parallax scrolling for either background or foreground elements. I've only used this in one map. Because I don't have any parallax scrolling on this map, I set it to zero. The next number is Y shift, vertical movement shift that differs from the player movement. Same as before, I set it to zero because there's no parallax scrolling. And the very last number is blending mode. Zero is no blending mode whatsoever. One means a blending mode of addition or linear dodge. Two means multiply. 3 is for screen blending mode. Now here are Photoshop's description of each of these blending modes. Add, also known as linear dodge. This blending mode looks at the color information in each channel and brightens the base color to reflect the blend color by increasing the brightness. Blending with black produces no change. Multiply. This blending mode multiplies the luminosity of the base color by the blend color. The resulting color is always a darker color. White produces no change, while the black pixels remain. Multiply can produce many different levels of darkening depending on the luminosity values of the blend layer. Multiply is a great blending mode for darkening images or creating shadows. And lastly, Screen. Screen can produce many different levels of brightening depending on the luminosity values of the blend layer, making screen a great blending mode for brightening images or creating highlights. Does that make sense? <laughs> 
Uh, it's okay if not. Like, basically, zero for no blend, so normal images like the main map. I barely use addition or linear dodge. Multiply or the number two for shadows. Screen or number three for light sources. In this case, I use zero. Those are the real basics. I'll quickly run through another example. These three layers are for drawing the rain outside the window. So here, layer 20, rain 3, then layer 21, layer 22. First, I type in layer in all caps. Second, map ID, I leave that out. Three, the layer number, so 20, 21, 22 respectively. It doesn't really matter what number you type in here, as it doesn't affect how the drawings are rendered. They just have to be unique numbers. Four, the file names. This is what rain 3 looks like. I bought it off a stock image website. And since it was a vector image, I rasterized it and then converted it into a PNG with transparency, and then I edited it in Photoshop. 5. Horizontal movement. There's a bit of alternating horizontal movement between the three layers, and I did this to add depth. So the layers are 15, 10, and 25. A positive number indicates left movement, a negative number for right movement. Here I'm just going to remove the map layer and show how the different rain layers are rendered uh, in comparison to each other. The next number is vertical movement. This will be a lot more extreme than horizontal movement, and there are different speeds for each other. A positive number for the image to move up, and since it's rain, it'll be a negative number so that it moves downwards. The next number is opacity. I have different opacities to create a layered effect for each of the layers. And again, this number needs to be between 0 and 255. Next number after that is the Z axis. So this is behind the ground layer 0. It needs to be a negative. I also have the layer showing outside the room on layer negative 5. So I made this negative 2 to be in between them. So the next two numbers are X shift and Y shift. This is for parallax scrolling again. Because I'm not doing parallax scrolling, both of these will be 0. Lastly would be blending mode. I use the screen effect for all my rain, so number 3. But shadows, it would be multiply, so number 2. And for water and fog, I did a mix between screen and multiply, so 2 and 3. So yeah, I did this for every room. <laughs> I tweaked overlay layers, collision maps, so everything works out with the player's collision hitbox and its sprite. And I set all the teleports in the room to correspond to the appropriate rooms. It doesn't look like much, to be honest, but it took so fucking long, like, holy shit. But I hope that was informative, at least. So, I've had to rewrite this part of the script a couple of times. I was originally going to provide a Google Drive link with a sample project of the particular set of plugins I used to get my game to look like this. But then I checked the terms and agreements for Yanfly, Galv, and Qshus's plugins, and redistributing plugins as a sample project for other people to learn from does go against both Yanfly's and Galv's terms and agreements, not Qshus's. I respect this, and as such, I won't be uploading a sample project. But it's honestly not that hard to set up these plugins. Here is the order that I set up the plugins. Uh, if you just copy this, you should be good to go. Then you can insert your own PNGs into the layers folder that you have to create, and then you can add collision maps and parallaxes, etc. By doing this method, it's way more liberating than the previous method that I showed before. For example, I'll add in the map for Spell Hold from Baldur's Gate 2 into the directory and see how it renders in MV. I haven't really experimented with how big the dimensions of the PNGs can get before things start messing up, but so far I'm sticking to roughly like 4000 by 6000 pixel resolutions. By MV standards, that's about 50 tiles wide by 30 tiles high, but I'm sure you can go beyond this. Now again, I can't stress that this is a huge advantage uh, doing this method compared to my previous Parallax video. In the previous one, I showed how I created the map using default tile sets, then I printed it out, and then I drew a new map that corresponded to the same layout as the original map. This was because the collisions and movement were still mapped to that 90 degree grid. This made the process quite restrictive. But if you do it this way and you map custom collisions etc, you don't have to worry if the map you're importing lines up exactly to the grid that RPG Maker makes you work with. You can import anything and arrange the map collisions and event triggers however you want. The workflow would be to create whatever map that I want to, then import it into RPG Maker, and then create all the game logic according to the map, 
as opposed to what I did previously, which was to create all the game logic in RPG Maker and then create a map out of that, if that makes sense. It's a lot more efficient and creatively liberating. Hmm, what else? Oh yeah, um, I think one really important thing I want to say is, even though there is interest in making parallax maps in RPG Maker, and while the outcome is very nice, after working on them for so long, it's definitely not the most efficient way of making maps in RPG Maker. It's very satisfying, don't get me wrong, having these handcrafted, bespoke environments, but I think these sorts of tutorials create a level of expectation for people starting out in RPG Maker that this is the way to do mapping, when I still think it's a very niche way of creating maps. I feel like I need to really improve my workflow and use tile sets or have more repeatable elements that I could copy paste throughout the maps. Because while it's very nice, having a nice map is just a small portion in how a game works, I feel. There's just so many other things that you could be spending your time on rather than like fiddling with very custom made parallax maps. If it's your first project, I think it's much, much better to work with the base assets first and create something out of that. That way you're not fiddling with the tiny aesthetic details that don't necessarily contribute to the main core experience of your game. Just honestly don't care what it looks like to begin with. Ask yourself more, what do I want from this project, no matter how big or small? When you're just creating ideas and seeing them come to life on the screen, you know, adding characters and mechanics, story arcs, the less resistance between you and the program, uh, the better, as it allows you to just throw ideas onto the screen in a really playful manner, and you're not second guessing yourself at every turn and trying to be a perfectionist. The more resistance between you and the software, or the more moments where you get stuck, or you feel like what you're creating isn't up to ridiculously high standards, those pain points are when you want to give up. Trust me, I've been there multiple times. The only way to stick to a project, I feel, is to really be as kind to yourself as possible. Just remind yourself, this is what I really want to do. The sheer joy of creating and enjoying the process. Starting off small and then layering all sorts of new and exciting things on top of what you already made. And also being curious about other people's projects and the new and exciting plugins that are always created by the community every day. And the various aspects of RPG Maker and what it can offer you. I think some of the most pure fun that I had in RPG Maker was when I was just playing around with the base assets and not really caring too much about parallax mapping or animations or how it looked. It was more just creating my own little world and seeing the characters I want to see and interact with. Personally, that's what I encourage the most to do. Then later on, if you feel like wanting to have parallax mapping or more fluid walk animations, then you can just take whatever I make in these tutorials and apply it to your own projects. A lot of what I learned here is through months, uh, even years of experimenting, getting things wrong, and eventually succeeding in areas where I got stuck on. For example, this area with the cliff and the waterfall, I was stuck on for nearly a whole month because for the life of me, I couldn't comprehend how to have two separately animated layers, one for the waterfall and one for the ocean and for the little pond up here. The pond up here uses the same textures as the ocean, uh, but it has another layer on top of it to make it look like there's less layers, if that makes sense. The main issue came from having them animated at different speeds and using different textures without them conflicting with each other. And then suddenly one day, after weeks of adjusting, uh, it just clicked. And it was so satisfying to see that, like this huge sense of accomplishment just came over me. I want to share these learnings with other people so that you don't have to necessarily struggle the same way I did. So I could keep talking, there's so many little things I could talk about, but I'll finish up this video for now and start working on the next video. Like this video took way too long to make already. Take care and see you in the next one. Bye.